Welcome. I don't need to yell that loud. I have mic'd up. Uh, I hope you all are thriving and flourishing. I hope you're feeling blessed and highly favored today. We will be working through a piece of on violence, which you should have hopefully read uh, or will read by section. Uh, it comes from this book. We'll reference a couple different pieces of it soon. But uh, the statue that's depicted here is, is called Let Us Beat Swords into Plowshares. And this is a statue that's in one of the United Nations art collections that depicts biblical prophecies from Isaiah and Micah. In both cases, the, prophet, the prophets foresee a day in which violence and war will cease, when the weapons of war are destroyed and converted into agricultural or economic machines. This conversion indicates or conveys the cessation of hostility between humans when God finally establishes God's own rule over all the earth. Now, at first sight, on violence appears to radically contradict this sentiment, to advocate or endorse rather the sharpening of plowshares, the conversion of peace and harmony into war and discord. Yet, as we will see, Fanon's descriptions of violence indicate, I contend, both a fulfillment of these prophecies and their inversion, not just one side. They look to a future beyond colonial and retributive violence, ultimately. As Professor Ike mentioned, my name is Matthew Hamilton. You hopefully remember me introducing myself a couple of times or Professor Ike's uh, introduction just now. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student, exactly as he said, interested in political theory and international relations. And because of my interest in hegemonic exit and the ways in which hegemonic exit impacts vulnerable populations, Fanon is right up my alley and discusses uh, interests that are deeply intertwined with the things that I study. I'm excited to get into uh, Fanon's thought with y'all, uh, but I have to admit beforehand, before we get into it, that working through this, I, I again, I assume some of you have read it at this point, some of you are probably waiting a couple more days to do that, but uh, I was really troubled in trying to think through how we walk through this, how we engage this text. On Violence confronts us perhaps as a uniquely difficult text, and for me, it's especially challenging because of this concept of violence. There's an inescapable tension here where, on one hand, uh, as a devout Catholic Christian, I cannot in good conscience advocate for violence. The apocalyptic vision of Jesus's church is the meek inheriting the earth, the lion and the lamb sharing green pastures together, and ultimately the irrevocable abolition of death itself. And many find in Fanon's on violence an endorsement or even a glorification of this violence. The initial pages, for example, read, In its bare reality, decolonization reeks of red-hot cannonballs and bloody knives. And now playing on biblical imagery himself, Fanon continues, For the last can be the first only after a murderous and decisive confrontation. This vivid depiction throws us immediately into a lucidity that seems to exalt violence. Later, Fanon tells us in a passage to which we'll return throughout this lecture, a passage that kind of orients what we're talking about today, Fanon says that at an individual level, violence is a cleansing force. Because this is unsurprising that commentators like Hannah Arendt, who we'll read next week, I believe, saw Fanon's controversial text as extolling the virtues of violence, of commending it to us as good and just. But my concerns about endorsing violence only represent one half of my own consternation with this text. Importantly, the, the, the violence that Fanon, Fanon purportedly glorifies is reactive. It's a reaction. The violence Fanon describes is not an invasion, an imposition, or an occupation by the Algerians. Rather than leading or instigating, it follows. It responds to preceding violence that has already occurred. It reacts to it. And insofar as I fear I may appear to endorse or promote violence in discussing Fanon's work, I feel similarly uncomfortable with, commend with condemning rather Fanon's thought from the safety and security of a Georgetown University lecture hall. Fanon and I occupy deeply divergent spaces, spaces, as will be illustrated shortly, and it seems somewhat insidious to me, perhaps even cowardly, to unilaterally denounce the use of revolutionary violence without experiencing the full weight of near-perpetual racist and colonial violence. <laughs> 
well, I may have the luxury of contending against injustice pacifistically through donations, attending protests, and more. Fanon understood Algerian freedom as incommensurate with pacifism, and he personally bore the costs for such a conviction, joining the Algerian resistance movement and devoting his brief life to the decolonial struggle. Seeing as I do not bear the existential weight of French colonialism, it seems inappropriate to me to also just dismiss Fanon out of hand. And so this leaves me in quite a conundrum with this text, neither wanting to endorse and promote or extol the virtues of violence, but also not wanting to overlook the deep, deep, deep depravity of colonialism. I think, however, if we pay close attention, if we really look at what's going on here, we'll recognize that Fanon, rightly or wrongly, draws our attention to something much deeper than violence per se. For Fanon, the enduring violence of European racism and colonialism necessitates violent revolt, not because violence is some legitimate good in itself, but because it offers the only way for subjugated people to retake their own humanity. For Fanon, violence both against the Algerians, both against and by the Algerians, has a psychologically, psychological and almost theological effect that impacts subjugated people's self-concept. Colonialism destroys their humanity, and retaliatory violence is the only thing, according to Fanon, that allows them to recapture it. Violence constitutes, therefore, something akin to a baptism, a ritual that enables the colonized person to overcome colonial, uh, colonialism's original sin and to be born again. Before we continue and get into kind of the meat of this and unpack what I've just, what I've given you an overview, I want to give you an overview of the kind of structure of this lecture and where we're going to be going today. So I'll begin with some background remarks on Fanon's life. So you have an understanding of where he came from, what his background was, what sort of influences he had in writing on violence. I will, uh, that, that thread will continue throughout the, the discussion, but we'll kind of pause there at a moment in Fanon's life and begin working our way through what I call colonial violence as original sin. Now, if, if you've read this text, you probably recognize that it's incre incredibly ununified. There's not a clear uh, coherence to it. There's one paragraph on one subject, and then two paragraphs later, Fanon's talking about something entirely different, uh, to something completely and entirely different. And so this threefold typology that I'm giving you, this colonial violence as original sin, violence as baptism and rebirth, and then uh, post-colonial apotheosis is a little bit of a framework that I'm putting onto this so that we can hopefully make sense of the major key themes that are, that are occupying this text. So the uh, colonial violence is original sin. We'll get into the antecedent violence, the, the colonialism, what was taking place in this milieu. We'll move into violence as baptism and rebirth and see the ways in which Fanon understands violence as allowing the colonized to re-grab their humanity. And then ultimately, we'll discuss briefly uh, the vision that Fanon has after this violence. Once this violence has been successful, what happens next? We'll conclude uh, with, a, a, with some concern about practical application about what this text means for us today, as well as some critiques of Fanon more generally. The text we read today is, is the product of Fanon very late in his life. He died tragically at only 36 years old, actually right up the street from us in Bethesda, Maryland. He died of leukemia. He had sought treatment in the, United, in the USSR and in Rome, but ultimately the CIA had brought him to the US for treatment. He survived only a few more months prior to his passing, after which he was buried back in North Africa. On Violence was originally published outside of this book. It was published in a French journal just a few months before his passing. He dictated pretty much all of his late writing, writing that would eventually be bound up into the wretched of the earth, to his wife, who oversaw the eventual publication. Two major components of his life experiences and personality are really going to shape our understanding and our ability to get into on violence. The first is him being a soldier. He was born in Martinique at the time of French colony in the Caribbean, and Fanon's family was relatively well off, but he nonetheless had a, a desire to join the French military. At one point in his life, the French government in exile had set up a, a kind of temporary government in France, and 
the the French French rulership in Martinique was deeply, deeply, deeply racist. And this was the, the first, maybe the first experience that Fanon had that would begin to color his experiences throughout his time in the military. After joining the, the French forces, uh, he became an active com combatant in North Africa, eventually being awarded basically the equivalent of a Purple Heart for being wounded in battle. But as I mentioned, Fanon's military experiences were, were really colored by racial hierarchy. You have this initial experience in his life of this, this temporary government and their racist policies, even collaborating with Nazi Germany. And then later in the French military in North Africa, he finds similar racist hierarchies within this force. First, he sees in the colonized world a divided community where you have the, the wealthy French settlers in, in Algeria, and then you have the native uh, or more native Arab community that is, is living in squalor, that's living in poverty, that's unable to reach the kind of flourishing that the French settlers had. But more than this, Fanon experiences it within his own regiment, within his own uh, participation in the French. Uh, military service. Black and white soldiers, for example, did not wear the same uniform, live in the same barracks, or eat the same food. West Indians were separated from Europeans who were separated from North Africans. David Macy, one of Fanon's chief biographer, biographers, summarizes this well. He says, it was becoming clear that the heteroclite army, which Fanon had hoped would free Europe and the world from fascism and racism, was in fact structured around an ethnic hierarchy with white Europeans at the top and North Africans at the bottom. This racism reappeared when soldiers were successful, when they did what they were supposed to do. Macy writes, uh, describing experiences that Fanon describes in a book that we'll turn to briefly, that local girls who were often freed from occupation preferred American dancing partners rather than black Martinicans. In Black Skin and White Masks, which, we'll, again, we'll get into in just a moment, Fanon describes with considerable bitterness how white French girls backed away in fear when black French soldiers asked them to dance. It's no surprise, then, that Fanon developed a difficult relationship with France and with French culture. On one hand, Fanon had personal experiences with violence. He understood the costs and part participated in warfare with his own body and not just his words. But beyond this, his experiences with racism led him down a very different path. After completing his military service for the French, Fanon became a medical doctor, a psychiatrist to be specific. Fanon studied psychiatry in France, exploring in part the racism that he had experienced in the military. The story I referenced about American women reacting with fear to Martinican's dancing invitation appears in this text, Black Skin and White Masks, which I had intended to bring and forgot entirely. This text was effectively his doctoral dis dissertation as Fanon became fascinated by the psychological impacts. He often uses the terms alienation and neuroticism of racism. Black Skin and White Masks presents incredibly helpful insight into Fanon's psychological dis disposition and offers us keys to seeing the psychological nature of on violence. We have this, this odd, bizarre quote from Fanon in On Violence, or sorry, not in On Violence, in Black Skin and White Masks. He says, man is not the potential for self-consciousness or negation. If it be true that consciousness is transcendental, we must also realize that this transcendence is obsessed with the issue of love and understanding. Man is a yes resonating from cosmic harmonies, uprooted, dispersed, dazed, and doomed to watch as the truth he has elaborated vanish one by one. He must stop projecting his antinomy into the world. Oh, this is a Fanon that's so dramatically different than the one that we see in On Violence. Here we get this almost humanistic Fanon, a Fanon with this just elegant perspective of humanity and human life. It's much different than the earlier quote about red hot cannonballs and bloody knives. Fanon continues that although his analysis in black skin and white masks is psychological, this psychic component cannot be divorced from the social and economic realities that structure it. 
Fernandez inextricably ties his concern for psychic well-being, for mental health, to socioeconomic structures. In concluding his psychological treatise, Fanon writes, I, a man of color, want but one thing. May man never be instrumentalized. May the subjugation of man by man, that is to say, of me by another, cease. May I be allowed to discover and desire whatever he may be. Black Skin and White Masks offers a few unique insights into Fanon that we don't initially get from on violence. First, as I, as I kind of teased, Fanon is poetic. He isn't some callous Machiavellian who wants only to destroy and obliterate white colonists. It's clear that he has very legitimate concerns about human flourishing, about well-being, and that he pursues decolonization both literally and culturally to enable the full flourishing of both black and other subjugated persons. Second, and relatedly, it illustrates for us that Fanon's focus is self-actualization, so to speak. He's, again, he's interested in the psychic well-being, in mental health, in exploring the ways in which racism creates, in his words again, alienation and neuroticism for both black and white subjects. With his dissertation published, Fanon began his psychiatry residency, which landed him in North Africa. In Algeria, Fanon treating both French torturers trained to pacify the colonized and colonized subjects tortured by the same French soldiers. His experiences in Algeria provide the necessary context for understanding the reactive violence that is discussed in On Violence. Did I go back? There we go. Sweet. Okay, cool. Before we continue, what we're discussing today, the things that we get into are often very dark and somber. Discussing colonial violence uh, is not exactly something that's like super uplifting and exciting. It's, it's tough to walk out of here and be stoked about what we just discussed today. And those of you, some of you have probably heard me lecture in other classes. I often try to incorporate a little bit of a more humorous take on things uh, it, because I think it helps facilitate us understanding these. But that just doesn't seem like the right tone for this. And instead, in engaging these things, I'm, I'm going to pause briefly for questions. But the goal in part is to have a little bit of a more contemplative space. The opportunity to, to feel our emotional responses to these things, to, to allow them to kind of weigh on us and think through and process them while we're here. So I'm going to pause in just a moment to give us just a minute of silence uh, to just quiet and whatnot. I'll guide us a little bit in that. Uh, but I do want to pause for questions. We're about, again, about to get into the original sin, the threefold typology that I have. But is there anything thus far that I've covered uh, that we want to pause briefly on and ask questions about? All right, so real quick, again, I, I said I, I recognize it's a bit of an odd thing to do in a lecture, and I, uh, the next thing I'm going to say is a little bit dangerous, but uh, I wanna, I'm going to give you one minute, and I want you to uh, try to get as comfortable as you can in these dastardly chairs. Uh, I want you, if, if it's most comfortable for you to stare up in the space, then do that. If it's most comfortable for you to uh, close your eyes, do that. Uh, I definitely don't want to see you looking at your laptop. That doesn't count as relaxation. And I'm going to take one minute to just like, just kind of breathe. Just listen to your breathing. Listen to your heartbeat. We want to try to have things as quiet as we can for one minute. And I'll bring us back after that. All right, come back. 
So in that, with that kind of more, hopefully a little bit more of a reflective uh, mindset as being present in this room and with ourselves, this is the quote that I want to return to throughout this lecture that's going to prove as kind of the anchor point, because I think it summarizes a lot of what we see going on throughout this time. At an individual level, violence is a cleansing force. It rids the colonized of their inferiority complex, of their passive and despairing attitude. It emboldens them and restores their self-confidence. So I want to pause and ask you, what, is, what are the reactions that this brings out of you? Is there something that you're like, um, it, can be, it can be mental. It can be, this is what I think is going on here. This is what I think Fanon is talking about. This is his emphasis. Or it can be something more emotional of saying, this is how I like react. This is the visceral reaction that this text brings out. Because I, I want to make sure we get through everything. But... Uh, the uh, kind of couple pieces that I want to try to bring out here is that this text does two things, and pretty much these things you highlighted already very well, is it, it draws our attention to something that happened previously. So you can see the cleansing force. If, if something needs to be cleansed, there's an implicit assumption that it was soiled, that there was something dirty, there was something problematic there previously. And then similarly, we have this language of restoration. And this idea of restoration only happens whenever something's broken, whenever it needs to be fixed, when there's been a problem. And so the first thing that this passage draws our attention to is this antecedent violence, this thing that comes before to which the violence that Fanon is discussing responds. The second part that we'll see, which is deeply connected to this, is the, the subject, the protagonist, so to speak, of this narrative, and that is the colonized. And that is the subject, the, the, the drama that Fanon unfolds for us, the colonized is going to be the chief subject, the protagonist of this drama. I think I want to go one more. Yes, I do. On Violence begins by, by focusing on that antecedent violence similarly. Fanon opens it by saying national liberation national reawakening or the restoration of the nation to the people whatever the name used whatever the latest expression decolonization is always a violent event decolonization both here and in this passage to which we'll return throughout the lecture it's it's a reaction it's not a first step but a response to a step that has already been taken and so the question becomes what is this antecedent violence the violence to which national liberation reacts the antecedent violence for Fanon, the sort of original sin or Adamic fall, so to speak, that literally dehumanizes the colonized and therefore necessitates their rebirth via violence is colonialism, specifically French colonialism in North Africa. And to understand the psychic renewal that violence affords necessitates understanding this antecedent violence first. Now, similarly, I hesitate to go too deeply into this because I think it runs a risk of voyeurism. And we're already talking about subjects that are really deep and dark. And to just spend 15 minutes talking about the horrors of French colonialism seems like maybe not the right uh, pedagogical path. But with that said, I think there's a couple small vignettes. There's a couple points that I can make that illustrate the depth of suffering that was going on. And so to one of those, one of those, I want to, I'm going to throw this back to y'all. There's a story of a French school teacher in uh, North Africa in Algeria who posed to their students, their students were between 10 and 14. So I expect much more thoughtful and mature responses from y'all, but they, they asked their, their students, what would you do if you were invisible? So a couple of you, if you had 24 hours to be invisible, what would you do? Can I get a couple of hands? Yeah, what's up? Probably hide in my room. <laughs> Why? Because, like, if I'm outside, someone's probably just gonna like walk right into me. Uh, <laughs> that's a good word. That's a good word. I like I like the uh, moral purity of that one. James, what's up? Um, I'd probably just try and go somewhere where I wouldn't be able to get in, like usually. Mm. Like, there are important people that are talking that I want to listen to, and like. It's the sun behind the I like that. So just like sneak into the White House or something, just hang out for a little while. Cool. So we'll we'll yeah we'll stop there. I appreciate the, those two. The the ten to fourteen year olds. Every single one of them responded that they would steal weapons and kill French soldiers. These students were reacting to historic and current events. France took control of Algeria by defeating Turkish rulers, but they immediately violated the terms of surrender and repeatedly massacred non-combatants. 
the French authority summarizes the events for the French king well. This is a, obviously a huge block of text, but I'll read through it, and the last bit summarizes it uh, very vividly. This is, again, a French account of what they've done. This is not somebody attacking the French or being polemical about what they've done. It says, acting on mere suspicion without trial, we have executed people whose guilt subsequently proved to be more than doubtful. On the basis of suspicion, we have massacred whole populations who later proved to be innocent. We have put on trial men who are regarded as the country's saints, men who are venerated because they had the courage to resist our rages. We have thrown tribal chieftains into dungeons because their tribes gave our deserters asylum. We have honored treason by calling it negotiation, described shameful ambushes as diplomatic acts, and now playing on the de derogatory designation of non-whites as barbarians, the French author concludes, in a word, we have outdone the barbarism of the barbarians we came to civilize. Massacres, bombings, and more became commonplace in Algeria over the years. Both between, the, both between French and Algerians and also between competing Algerian factions. Non-combatants were executed without trial in a soccer stadium in one case. And competing Algerian liberation groups somewhat wantonly bombed public cafes to target opposing leadership. This is a bombed out cafe here. Consistent horrifying violence thus characterized North Africa up to and during the Algerian revolution, which formally erupted in 1954. These circumstances very naturally led Fanon to reflect deeply on violence and colonialism. In another text, he defines uh, colonialism as the organization of domination and the war of liberation as not seeking for reforms, but, and this is key, the grandiose effort of a people which had been mummified to rediscover its own genius, to reassume its history and assert its sovereignty. Fanon, again, gives us a glimpse into his chief concern here. The liberation isn't endorsed because war or violence is somehow some good in itself, and he isn't unilaterally endorsing war. Instead, Fanon's concern is a, quote, mummified people, a nascent and underdeveloped genius in some relationship between a collective and their history or self-sovereignty. Beyond these really uh, dark and visceral experiences, you also have the language of racism under colonialism that similarly stripped people of their humanity. The ethnic slurs that were aimed at Algerians associated them with rats and goats, again, stripping their humanity in ways far more subtle than gunpowder and bombs. <laughs> in both cases, they served to render the colonized subjects, the protagonist of this narration, is subhuman. The realities of French colonial violence in Algeria thus permeated Algerian life comprehensively. When discussing the colonized inferiority complex or the need to be cleansed, Fanon isn't speaking into a vacuum or a space that afforded nonviolent remonstration. David Macy, again, Fanon's bi biographer, summarizes the historical moment well, saying, By 1961, violence was everywhere. It had even seeped into the unconscious. Now, Fanon recognized this, and therefore the problem Fanon specifically engages regarding colonialism is its psychological effects. He finds in it a psychic death which mummifies the colonized people, obliterates their humanity, and prevents their flourishing, their development. The realities of colonial violence necessitated something far deeper for Fanon than, quote, less racist, more open, and more liberal types of behavior. Understanding this necessitated dramatic action and led Fanon to submit a now famous resignation letter. As I mentioned, he was counseling and providing psychiatric help for Algerians, but also for French soldiers who were torturing the same Algerians he was treating. And he felt that he could no longer be complicit in this French cause. Fanon resigned his post as a psychiatrist in Algeria and moved to Tunis. Re returning to his days of soldiering, only now to support decolonization efforts across Africa. In resigning, Fanon called the degree of alienation of the inhabitants of this country frightening and declares that the enduring violence is the logical consequence of an abortive attempt to decerebralize a people. 
Fanon concludes in his resignation letter, the decision I have reached is that I cannot continue to bear a responsibility on the false pretext that there is nothing else to be done. And with that, Frantz Fanon threw himself headlong into fighting for Algerian independence, for a unified and free Africa, and most importantly, for the rebirth of dominated people. Pause briefly for questions. We'll, we'll, now we're moving into the, the rebirth section. Is there anything else that we want to follow up on that real quick? Excellent. We'll keep it moving. So with all this, this context, we're finally able to turn to the center, the real focus of on violence, specifically the apparent endorsement of colonized people to turn their plowshares into swords, return violence for violence, and thereby recapture their humanity, their psychic dignity. Fanon has illustrated how colonial violence dehumanizes the subjects, but he goes further, arguing that it inculcates a certain violence within the colonized, a violence that seeks an outlet. His use of the word here, the words here, rids, for example, indicates that there's some energy, Fanon often uses the language of libido, caused by colonial expression that must be expelled from the body. We can see some more characterization of this psychic energy as a despairing attitude or uh, the lack of self-confidence or rather the regaining of self-confidence. Fanon delineates a number of ways in which the violence spills over from the colonized psyche, often ways that uh, attempt to preempt, to prevent violence from erupting. So the first thing that, that Fanon sees as, as a means to expel this violence is the intra-colonized violence, effectively the warfare between parties who are similarly dominated by the French. This ultimately fails to, to alleviate the psychic tension, but Fanon still sees the intra-ethnic violence as caused by colonial hierarchies, writing, the muscular tension of the colonized periodically erupts into bloody fighting between tribes, clans, and individuals. And to be clear, this is all now coming from on violence. Whereas Fanon says the, the colonist or the police officer can beat the colonized subject day in and day out, insult him and shove him to his knees. It is not uncommon to see the colonized subject draw his knife at the slightest hostile look or aggressive look from another colonized subject. Again, Fanon is drawing our attention to the way in which this colonial structure leads people who are similarly dominated, who are similarly under oppression to fight with each other and to try to expel that violence, that libido caught up in them at one another, rather than against the one who's actually oppressing them. This fratricidal bloodbath, as Fanon calls it, serves as a distraction, an outlet for the alienation caused by colonialism, but only temporarily. For Fanon, the emergence of armed struggle against colonialism is the inevitable alternative. Therefore, while the intra-colonized violence may present a temporary outlet, outlet for the colonized, history pushes them forward to eventually confront the true protagonist, the colonizer. Fanon concludes, so one of the ways the colonized subject releases his muscular tension is through the very real collective self-destruction of these internecine feuds. But there's one other outlet, there's one other way that the colonized try to, to get rid of this energy, and Fanon sees that as spiritualism. Again, centering the psyche, he explores the spirituality of the colonized, arguing that this provides a temporary release of their alienation. Fanon writes that the colonized subject manages to lose the sight of the colonist through religion. Tangibly, this spiritualism overflows from the colonized psyches, especially in dance and demonic possession. At a fixed time and a fixed state, men and women assemble in a given place, Fanon writes, and under the solemn gaze of the tribe launch themselves into a seemingly disarticulated, but in fact extremely ritualized pantomime. Here, the exorcism, liberation, and expression of community are grandiosely and spontaneously played out through the shaking of the head and back and forth thrusts of the body. Fanon continues that the sole purpose of the gathering is to let the supercharged libido, the stifled aggressiveness, spew out volcanically. Symbolic killings, figurative cavalcades, and imagined multiple murders 
everything has to come out. Intercolonized violence and religion thus provides some outlet for the psychological duress caused by colonialism, but it cannot eternally contain this aggressive energy. Fanon sees these as mere detours to the inevitability of violence. He says, after years of unreality, after wallowing in the most extraordinary phantasms, the colonized subject, machine gun at the ready, finally confronts the only force which challenges his very being, colonialism. The challenge, therefore, is to seize this violence and to realign it, to direct it to its proper place. But even before the colonized can participate in national liberation, there's one more impediment that stands in the way. And this is us. This is the intellectual. Reminiscent of King's discussions of the white moderates, we find two intellectuals in nonviolence. In this case, it's both the colonizer and the colonized. Both seek to preclude violence in the liberatory struggle. First, we encounter the colonizing intellectuals, and more specifically, the French intellectuals. And Fanon typically calls these the colonialist bourgeoisie. The, col the colonizer is primarily referred to as the colonialist bourgeoisie, and they are tied closely to notions of civilization, of abstract virtues and values. The bourgeoisie who dwell in this, this nexus of ideation about values become concerned with liberation, especially when the colonized begin to agitate in more radical ways. They, in these moments, reach out to the colonized elites, to those members of the colonized classes who attended French universities, and discuss purportedly eternal values like human dignity, reasonableness, and the like values which they themselves have contradicted for decades, if not centuries. They establish relations with the colonized intellectuals, discussing these values in the proper way to achieve national liberation. As the liberation crisis intensifies, the col colonialist bourgeoisie switches tactics. While colonialism has been a mechanism of military domination, in this case it becomes, quote, a rearguard campaign in the fields of culture, values, and technology. In many cases, the, the bourgeoisie win this campaign and effectively install more moderate values and tendencies in the colonized, rulings cl colonized ruling class. The colonized intellectual, influenced by these metropolitan moderates, have a rather ambiguous relationship to violence. Having been influenced by the lessons of Western values, the colonized intellectual introduces a variation on the demand, on the demand that the first become last, and advocate a more moderate, less violent position. The colonized intellectuals are therefore a half-step they're more moderate liberationists who find their goals, their own personal goals, often incompatible with the demands of decolonization. Fanon castigates these halfway attempts, criticizing the intellectual for using the nation's poverty to achieve a place of prominence for themselves rather than having a commitment to their community. Their affinities for the colonialist bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie chastens their revolutionary spirit. And Fanon notes that nationalist political parties never insist on the need for confrontation precisely because their aim is not the radical overthrow of the, the system. On the specific issue of violence, the elite are ambiguous. They are violent in their words and reformist in their attitudes. Fanon even slips linguistically into associating the colonized intellectual by calling them the bourgeoisie, identifying them even more closely with the French class as opposed to the masses to which we now turn. The masses create a rupture. They, they create a break into this, this pacifistic approach. The masses are the people are a dramatically different side of the coin than what we've seen thus far. And a rift opens up between the masses and the colonized intellectual for the masses demand for the last to be first, while the intellectual continues to advocate for more moderate and a less violent vision. 
In some cases, Fanon envisions a collision between the people and the intellectual that provides the intellectual an opportunity to grow and to become truly revolutionary. It's only by engagement with the masses that the colonized intellectual can move beyond their moderacy. But in most cases, the division between the classes only increases. The nationalist parties ultimately seek only their own interests, or more specifically, the interests of the powerful politicians animating the parties. On the other hand, the peasantry, Fanon says, is systematically left out of most of the nationalist party's propaganda. For Fanon, the peasantry holds the keys for successful decolonization, for it's only the peasantry who is revolutionary. They recognize, based on their class position, that colonialism isn't a system with which one can dialogue. Instead, colonialism will only give when it is confronted with violence. The masses, the people, the peasantry, they are the ones who therefore hold the key to revolution. They have experienced the depths of colonial violence and suffered this original sin most profusely. They have had their psyches oriented toward aggression. And after trying to exercise this libido that we have discussed in multiple ways, they find the thirst for revol revolution is inescapable. And while the intellectuals try to impede this historical unfolding, they ultimately cannot choke off the passion of the masses, and instead, violence ensues. This brings us back to this, pa this passage, and we filled in a lot of the different pieces here, a lot of the kind of context, but this question still remains of violence. When Fanon says violence, what is going on here? What is the meaning of this? And for Fanon, violence operates as a cleansing force, alleviating the pent-up aggression caused by colonialism and giving the colonized a new life, reflecting the desires of the masses and not the preferences of the intellectuals. Violence offers a baptism, a rehumanization for those who have been animalized and lobotomized by colonial violence. This now enables us to answer the central question, what does Fanon mean by violence? Violence for Fanon was not wanton. Fanon himself, apparently and somewhat interesting, interestingly, belided disgust for violence himself. While well, I've already mentioned how he fought in both World War II and participated in African decolonial struggles, and obviously in that sense, bore the physical weight of violence on his own body. A meeting with fellow philosophers later in life demonstrated an unexpected unease with violence. Late in life, he met with Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir at, in Rome. Sartre had been a major intellectual influence on Fanon, and Sartre had been critical of French colonialism. Therefore, Fanon considered him something of an ally. Fanon actually writes the foreword to this text as well. Fanon, therefore, requested a meeting with Sartre in an attempt to meet his intellectual forefather. In these meetings, Fanon's revolutionary zeal poured out. Though Sartre was in ill health due to years of drug use, Fanon insisted that Sartre stay up all hours of the night to discuss philosophy, even against Beauvoir's wishes. He was similarly critical of their bourgeois lifestyle, as they did not let their commitment to anti-colonialism and philosophy impede their excursions to local cafes and historic sites in Rome. Yet from these meetings, Beauvoir noted that Fanon personally disliked violence. His biography right, biographer writes, to Beauvoir's surprise, he proved to have a personal horror of violence. Although he justified the use of violence both on public platform and in print, he was obviously deeply distressed when he spoke of the violence inflicted by the Belgians in the Congo, the Portuguese in Angola. More surprisingly, he displayed the same emotion when he spoke of counterviolence of the colonized and of the settling of scores that had taken place within the FLN. He apparently thought that he himself was responsible for the death of a dear friend, which had arisen through some of the political struggles internal to the liberation movement. Now, at the same time, in this he apparently considered this a failing of his own, a way in which he himself had slipped into this intellectual position. 
Fanon himself therefore occupied a tenuous position of violence, feeling discomfort even with his own endorsement. Relatedly, Macy notes the provocative nature of the language in Fanon's text. Fanon's not talking about urban vandalism, Macy says, but about a broad historical process that necessarily involved violence. In a sense, he says, it is the term violence itself that's so scandalous. Had Fanon simply spoken of an armed struggle, the book might have been much less contentious. With these points in mind, the passage which we have returned to repeatedly should be fairly clear. Fanon's point, while a cursory me reading may seem to indicate that Fanon's point was about violence and killing and bombing, and then maybe he thought these to be great, to be laudatory. I contend, as I have throughout this lecture, that Fanon instead sees violence as exercising an aggressive psychic energy drummed up within the colonized by colonialism's dehumanization. Fanon's concerned far more with the psychological effects of colonialism and anti-colonial violence than rather than he has any moral calculation regarding violence's legitimacy. These conversations are only implicit in Fanon's advocacy. Again, we have this passage at an individual level. Violence is a cleansing force. It rids the colonized of their inferiority complex, of their passive and despairing attitude. It emboldens them and restores their self-confidence. With all these pieces in place, this somewhat enigmatic passage should be rather clear. We've looked at the colonized and the inferiority complex caused by colonialism, how Fanon theorizes his violence reactively as a second step rather than a first. And we've seen how violence offers a release for the psychological conditions caused by colonialism, how it allows, according to Fanon, the colonized to move beyond the strictures of colonialism to experience a rebirth. And finally, we see how Fanon theorizes violence itself not as a laudatory goal or something per se to be admired, but as dictated by the masses, as a necessity for the ultimate well-being of the colonized. I want to pause here again. This has, again, been a lot, talking about violence for a good bit of time. And so I want to take another minute to sit in silence, and then I'll pause for some more questions. So again, return to uh, the most comfortable space you can find. Please don't fall asleep. Uh, again, I recognize the difficulty in that when I tell you to close your eyes, but let's go ahead and take one minute to, uh, to just sit with the kinds of images and the things we've been discussing. All right, we have, a, we have a little bit more to get through. There's a couple different pieces that I want to touch on before we begin to wrap things up, but I want to pause. All right, we're going to keep things moving. I think I'm going to run through this last uh, section a little bit more quickly. So um, this, is, this is really kind of an addendum. It's the last development that we see in Wretched of the Earth. And again, following the kind of theological structure that I've given it, I've titled this The Eschaton. This is what comes after. After violence has been used, after things have been taking care of what happens next. And so the question is, if the colonized can exercise the violence instilled in them by colonialism through a national liberation effort, does this just create utopia? Can you just expel this, this violence, this libido, and then all of a sudden everything is great? Does this allow the swords to be refashioned ultimately back into plowshares? Unfortunately for Fanon, it's not that simple. Fanon recognizes the persistence of the problems, um, 
even once the psyche has been reborn through violence. There's a handful of different ways that he looks at this part, uh, may, mostly seeing that the nation building component, the, the place where Algeria, if they've been able to successfully expel French to, troops, and now they're rebuilding their own nature, their own identity, that kind of mummified genius that we talked about previously, that even this place is happening in a competitive environment. He specifically talks about ca capitalism and socialism or communism, and the, the, as a brief aside, he'll, he'll use the language of the third world often. That's a very like commonplace theme. The first world is capitalism, the second world is communism, and the third world are the nations that are caught up in that kind of crossfire. So when he's talking about the third world, he's talking about the, the competition, the, the position of being caught up in the competition between those two blocks. But so Fanon sees this as a necessarily an inherently competitive environment, but he does interestingly change to an economic focus. And so in this sense, this brings us back to the imagery that I gave at the beginning of having the plowshares, having this agriculture or economic tool, turning it into a sword, and then ultimately returning it back to a plowshare. And so Fanon envisions something somewhat radical that he sees first the ways in which the French withdrawal would impact Algeria economically, that the removal of capital would cause deep deep economic issues for Algeria. But instead, he envisions a way in which the masses in Algeria can align themselves with the masses of Europe. And that in reality, they both have a similar enemy, that the, the monopolies, the ruling classes who are colonizing Algeria are the same people who are oppressing the French masses. And so for Fanon, there's this eschatological vision, there's this future vision where he sees that one day the masses in France and the masses in Algeria can cooperate, can work together and use economic means. They can use things like boycotts. They can use things like living simply to force the monopolies to care for the previously colonized world. In wrapping up, I wanna address a couple critiques of Fanon that I think are worth, are worth mentioning. And then we'll we'll talk briefly about practical application and, and here. But I think that the first the first this quote is just hysterical. I think it's amazing. This was a comrade of Fanon's who was a part of the uh, liberation movement, who says Fanon is one of the greatest revolutionaries that Africa has ever known, and yet almost none of his theories proved to be accurate. Which I think is again the kind of critical takes that we had about like does violence is violence really the way to expel this kind of psychological duress is that's being expressed to a certain degree in here. Similarly, it's important to keep in mind that Fanon wrote this text while dying of leukemia, like a large part of which in the United States. He did not have access to recent developments or concrete facts. In some sense, the war went in a direction that was kind of unexpected for him, uh, necessitating negotiation rather than simply a, a full stop victory. More importantly, I think is Fanon's underdeveloped concept of the nation or of this collective psyche. And so I wanna bring us back to the quote I've referenced several times about a mummified psyche. Fanon says that colonialism is the organiz organization of domination, while the war of liberation is not a seeking for reforms, but the grandiose effort of a people which had been mummified to rediscover its own genius, to reassume its history and assert its sovereignty. This introduces really interesting metaphysical claims. What is a people? Is there some primordialist conception here where each ethnic group contains some genius or culture that needs to be cultivated? While Fanon's frequent reference to nations and national identity may make him attracted to nationalists and may concern those of us wary about nationalism, Fanon typically belies a rather expansive concept of the nation, one that maybe envelops all of Africa. Similarly, we saw how even in this often focus on the nation, he ultimately has a vision in which the masses in Algeria and the masses in Europe can ally with one another. Such an undefined concept presents challenges to utilizing, to theorizing through Fanon's work. So where does this leave us all? I started at the outset describing my misgivings regarding Fanon's theory of violence. 
This text, as I mentioned at the beginning, creates major problems for thinking through current practical application or for having concrete takeaways for us today. As a Catholic Christian, I can neither advocate for violence nor endorse it as rehumanizing a good conscience. We're ultimately all children of God, and the Christ's death reveals all our fratricidal violence as affronts against God. But Fanon leaves us with far more than this. While a cursory reading may lead us to believe that Fanon sees violence as some abstract good or something laudatory, we find a much more complicated account when reading closely, seeing that Fanon cares deeply about human flourishing, about those subject to dehumanizing suffering being made whole once again. In the biography I have referenced multiple times, David Macy writes, The wretched of the earth are still there but not in the seminar rooms where the talk is of post-colonial theory, not where we are right now. Instead, the wretched of the earth, he says, came out on the streets of Algiers in 1988, and the Algerian army shot them dead. They have subsequently been killed in the thousands by authoritarian Algerian governments and so-called Islamic fundamentalists. Had he lived, Fanon would still be angry, and his readers should be too. Fanon rightly titled this, however, The Wretched of the Earth. While Algeria and Black Algerians in particular suffered unique depravity during French colonization and decolonization, the wretched of the earth dwell with us still today. They inhabit concentration camps at the United States' southern border and in Xinjiang, China. They flee ethnic and religious violence in Myanmar or in Nigeria. The wretched of the earth also encounter us nearby too, on the streets outside of our campus, asking for a spare dollar or at least a humanizing hello. In all these cases, we find the image of God dehumanized into animal likeness. And with Fanon, we too should feel anger at these perpetual injustices and recognize the need for these individuals to rehumanize themselves, to recapture their dignity. Fanon's critiques of intellectuals' penchant for moderacy and inaction is in many ways similar to MLK's critiques of the white moderate or James Baldwin and Jordan Peele's criticisms of the white liberal. Time and tidy slow solutions may be most effective to those who have the luxury of their humanity, but those suffering the unique deprivation of their dignity may need something more urgent or perhaps even immoral. In many senses, these critiques can be applied to many of us, or at least to me. Concretely then, what does Fanon's on violence draw us into? What does it call us to or demand of us? First, I submit to you a recognition of the wretched, a recognition of the violence and injustices which obscure the image of God, the worth and dignity of our human friends and family. The antecedent violence must be recognized. And second, a commitment to rehumanizing these people, not as an act that we can do, but in creating space so that they can grab back their humanity. A willingness from us, like the European masses, to support their actions, even when they prove uncomfortable for us or challenge our personal status quo. Fanon, rather than being strictly a prophet of violence or some proponent of death, reveals himself to be devoted to the full psychic health of to the full psychic health, to the flourishing of the dehumanized, albeit in an unorthodox way. And so it's in the same vein, in the vein of the footsteps of a man who understood the importance of individual well-being, that I offer my typical closing remarks. If you've been in my section or heard me lecture previously, you know that I like to pause at the end of every teaching to remind you all that your grades and academic success do not determine your worth and dignity. As a human person, you have something beautiful and wonderful to share with the world, both intellectually and otherwise, and I exhort you to go forth and share those good gifts with others, especially by loving, supporting, and helping to rehumanize the wretched of the earth. Thank you.